Hey, my name is Frederick. In this video, I will explain product compliance for cross-border e-commerce sellers. Um, back in the day, or just a few years ago, small businesses were primarily importing products to their home country and, and selling it domestically. Let's say things have really changed in the last few years with uh, plenty of small businesses selling worldwide and, and this opens up our well literally a whole world of new new compliance issues that you may have to deal with. So this video applies to pretty much anyone that's selling internationally from your home country. Okay, you say you're based in the in the United States, you, you're selling to, to Europe or well even to Canada um, or vice versa. If you're importing products into another country that's another thing we see quite a lot, a lot of uh, Hong Kong based or mainland China based sellers opening up um, companies in the US without actually having a presence in the US or Europe for that matter. Uh, but, but for many product categories you need to set up a company, uh, a shell company, at least, at least some sort of entity to import goods into the country and make sure that you comply with various regulations. That's number two. And number three, if you're running a crowdfunding campaign, meaning that, okay, you raise funds um, through Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and all of a sudden you have backers from 25 different countries. How do you deal with compliance in that case? Number four, if you're selling from a fulfillment center, a lot, we, we see that a lot here in Hong Kong, um, small businesses um, selling worldwide cross-border using a fulfillment center, for example, EasyShip. Because then you also have to deal with compliance issues in many different countries. So I'm going to start with scenario A. Uh, this is by far the easiest one. Home country plus one. So you're selling products in your home country, for example, the United States, and you want to s start selling into another country or market, for example, the European Union. Well, it's pretty basic. It's, it's just the way you deal with compliance for your own country, but applied to that other country or market. You look at regulations that apply, be that safety uh, specific technical standards, say EN or ASTM standards, and chemicals and heavy metals regulations. That's number one. You create your label files, you complement your existing label files so that you comply with not just one, but two different countries. You book lab testing to test your product according to regulations in that country. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And well, also documentation. Um, another thing, uh, I'm going to get back to this, but many countries actually accept products that are compliant with regulations in the United States or the EU. Singapore is, is one such country that even allows you to decide between, well, they, they even give you two options in some cases, referring to a specific EU or US regulation, and you decide which one you want to pick. Because the situation is not that every single country on this planet uh, develop their own directives or completely different, different um, regulatory frameworks for product safety. That would be very wasteful. Okay, scenario B. This is um, this is when it gets a lot more complicated. Selling worldwide, worldwide cross-border e-commerce to be specific. Okay, and that could be a fulfillment center. It al could also be a crowdfunding campaign. Now you're facing two issues. Number one, problem A, is that there is no universal or global or United Nations. Uh, product compliance framework. It's not like with trademarking, for example, there's the Madrid Madrid protocol that applies in, I don't know, 150 countries or something. That doesn't exist for compliance. So what this means that each country or common market in the case of the European Union is, is free to set their own product regulations and standards, okay? So there's no global framework. And number two, global compliance is extremely expensive, meaning that if you would try to make your compliant product with, well, every single country on, on earth, and I had to Google that, but yeah, 195 at least, at least uh, recognized by the UN. So let's take a cost example. So a consultant cost, say a thousand dollars. In, in, in many cases, it's, it's a lot more expensive than that. A consulting fee, that's essentially to, to hire someone um, to, to um, assess the regulations that apply in a certain country. But yeah, that's a very low count. Lab testing, if you would do lab testing for every single country. So you take this $1,500 multiplied by 195 and that's, yeah, that's a lot of money. 
now this this is just a uh, this is just a ridiculous calculation and it's not accurate it's it's just a demonstration of that worldwide compliance is is it's unattainable it's it's just not it's not an option now of course it's not 195 different regulatory product compliance frameworks um, but this is just for the sake of demonstrating that it's it's not even it's it's a non-starter so when it comes to regulations like worldwide like uh, frameworks or or uh, sources we have the big three we have the United States we have the European Union and also mainland China, the People's Republic of China. And these are uh, the countries or, or well, governments that develop and implement uh, separate product regulatory frameworks covering everything from electronics to children's products and so on. So you want to sell in the EU, you need to comply with EU uh, EN71 regulations, for example, for children's products, for children's products in the States, it's CPSIA, and, and mainland China, they have their own framework, okay? So these are the big three, meaning that many other countries around the world actually accept EU regulations, for example, Turkey does, um, Switzerland does to some extent, even, even some Australian states and Singapore, as I just mentioned, can pick between the US and, and the EU. Another thing we see with, for example, Korea and even India adopting uh, certain uh, regulations directly from the EU, uh, to some extent, it's not 100%, it's not not, not but, but their own version, and they even call it the same thing. ROHS, ROS is, is one such example, but China is a very different animal. So these are the big three. And as I just mentioned, many countries around the world accept products that are compliant with US and or EU product regulations. Okay, what this means is that you don't necessarily need to comply with, you, you don't necessarily need to even look for a regulatory product uh, safety regulation uh, in each country because the thing is that most of them either base them on US or EU regulations or they even accept them outright so it's not like you have product regulations but unique product regulations or standards in each and every country on, on the planet so it's not as much of an issue as you as you might think now from the perspective of a small business the option you really have if you are if, if you're really serious about going worldwide, is, is US plus EU compliance, okay? Frameworks are different, but if you cover both, then you can be fairly sure that your product will be accepted pretty much anywhere, plus your home country. And this applies especially if you're based in Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. Then you have to deal with a regulatory framework also in, in your home country, okay? And let's take a look at another cost example. So, same numbers, but three frameworks to comply with, three legislations to comply with, okay? Just time three, 4,500. In reality, for most products, this will be more expensive, but it, it, it shows you uh, the difference between being selective, uh, having a strategy when it comes to deciding, okay, what, which regulations should I comply with compared to attempting to, to, um, to comply with everything worldwide. Because, uh, yeah, as said, that's, that's uh, a non-starter. Now, how does the Customs and Market Surveillance Authorities deal with cross-border e-commerce? And this, well, it, it's something I really want to cover uh, to put things in, into, into context here. And the truth is that most countries, if, if not every country, struggle with enforcing product compliance when it comes to cross-border e-commerce. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy to explain this. If you look at, say, the CPSIA, which, which covers children's products in the United States, came into force in 2008. Uh, CE marking in Europe, that sends sense early early uh, 90s, late 80s, something like that. That's, that's when, yeah, I think 94 maybe. Anyway, um, as, you, as you probably know, cross-border e-commerce, you know, AliExpress, Wish, um, also fulfillment centers, 
that was not really a thing even even like a decade ago so let's say that the authorities are not exactly uh they are not exactly up to date when it comes to the way that the supply chain is is changing worldwide so it's not like there are uh let's say that the customs don't check every single unit that comes in and ask for certificates whenever anyone is buying anything online pretty much what they say is that okay if you're a consumer and you buy something say you you you're, you're european and you you're buying something from a cross border e-commerce website in, in mainland china for example then you're responsible uh, for the safety of that product uh, the EU is not is not responsible for that and, and you can't really because they can't really enforce anything outside of the borders which they can when it comes to B2B imports because then it's a different thing then they have jurisdiction on that importer base in Europe and of course it's the same in, in the United States so yeah that's not a license to start selling uh, crap products but it explains why there's no clear answers sometimes. There's no like, this is how you do, this is the step-by-step -step process for, for cross-border e-commerce compliance. And this is something that uh, the EU, especially the EU, is, is now uh, becoming serious about in, in the last, last year or so. And I'm myself sitting down with, with uh, regulators in my home country a year ago discussing these issues. So I know that, yeah, they, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, that said, though, as a responsible e-commerce seller, and I'm sure you are one of those, you should definitely do everything you can to ensure that your products will be compliant. But worst case scenario from your perspective well that would be that your product will be seized and destroyed by the customs authorities resulting in an in a refund pretty much again um i don't want you to to see this you know as a reason as a license to sell um, unsafe products just because you use an offshore fulfillment center because end of the day especially if you do that to your home country and if something serious can happen they can still go after you but picture it like this you got a safe product is compliant is tested is matching american and european product regulations you've done everything you can okay and and as long as it's safe then that's primarily what, what, what really matters. And if it doesn't have an obscure labeling requirement in, in one country somewhere, that's not gonna result in, in you being extradited or anything like that. But take product safety seriously. That's, uh, and that's why we exist. That's the, that's the whole point. That's why we created Compliance Gate. So if you have questions about product compliance, Go to compliancegate.com slash help. Fill out some information about your product, where you plan to sell your products, age group, and so on. And we get back to you within 24 hours.